Phuket's green future is gaining good momentum and is fortunate to be getting the support, experience and resources of the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the world's largest foundation supporting a better world with the involvement of over 11,000 scientists and professionals. On Friday the 13th of May 2011, IBAT, the International Business Association of Phuket, held a meeting at Indochine Kalim under the title Working Together to Save Thailand Seas. Hosting the meeting was IUCN member Robert Mather, a graduate of Cambridge University, who has had a great deal of involvement in several environmental issues within Southeast Asia. Most recently, Robert has become involved in the project Mangroves for the Future, which is a unique partner-led initiative to promote investment in coastal ecosystem conservation for sustainable development. It provides a collaborative platform amongst many different agencies, sectors and countries who are addressing challenges to coastal ecosystem and livelihood issues to work towards a common goal. The issues addressed at the meeting were the coast and seas of Thailand, what IUCN is doing, mangroves for the future, marine park management effectiveness evaluation, building coastal resilience in Chantaburi and Trat, working with the private sector, the zero waste project on Koh Tao, and what is going on in Phuket. Thailand has almost 3,000 kilometers of coastline. Almost one third of that is along the Andaman coast and two thirds on the Gulf of Thailand coast. As most people are aware, they are in very different conditions and in many ways the Gulf of Thailand is much more productive. It's a shallower sea, 45 to 80 meters deep, and it has a lot and it has a lot of nutrients entering it from major rivers. Thailand's exclusive economic zone is around 360,000 square kilometers. Right now, Thailand produces around 3 million tons of seafood a year and this is worth at least $3 billion a year. Around three quarters of this seafood comes from marine capture and the remaining quarter is from aquaculture. Of the marine capture, 50% comes from fishing inside the exclusive economic zone and around 25% from outside of the exclusive economic zone. The remaining 25% comes from aquaculture. This all sounds very positive, however, there are some major problems when it comes to fisheries in Thailand. The catch per unit effort, a phrase used throughout the fishing industry, declined by 87% from the 1970s to the 2000s. That meaning, for every one day that people went out fishing in the past, they now have to go for almost 8 or 9 days to catch the same amount of fish. Another issue is that about 36 to 48 percent of the fish that are landed are considered as trash fish. Turning now to the aquaculture, which was mentioned previously, most of it is prawn production. Prawns make up about two thirds of the aquaculture production by weight and about 90 percent by value. The vast majority of prawn farms are on the Gulf Coast, probably 90 to 95 percent with the remaining 5% on the Andaman coast. The large boom in prawn farms is largely responsible for the huge decline in mangroves which is clearly noticeable in Thailand. In 1975 there were about 3,200 square kilometres of mangrove. By 1996 that area had halved to 1,600 square kilometres. Interestingly, after that initial boom in prawn farming it was acknowledged that it was necessary to take care of the mangroves and to start restoring them. And between 1996 and now, the area of mangroves has actually risen and half the area originally lost has been replaced. This part of the Andaman coast now account for 60% of the remaining mangroves in Thailand. On the Gulf Coast, there is much less mangrove, with Chantaburi and Trat together having 12% of the remaining area. One of the IUCN's flagship programs is called Mangroves for the Future. 
This was a program which actually started after the tsunami in 2004 and was initially focused on the tsunami affected areas and helping them to restore their livelihoods and restore the mangroves after that tsunami. The main vision for the mangroves of the future is to have healthy ecosystems and a more prosperous and secure future for coastal communities. The goal for mangroves of the future is to conserve, restore and sustain management of coastal ecosystems as a key natural infrastructure which supports human well-being and security. It is hoped this will be achieved by improving, sharing and applying knowledge, strengthening integrated coastal management institutions and empowering civil societies and enhancing coastal governance at all levels. As mentioned before, it was initially set up for the tsunami affected countries. However, it has now spread to other countries and most recently both Pakistan and Vietnam have been added as full members of the Mangroves for the Future initiative. And there are also a number of other countries known as dialogue countries or outreach countries, which in this part of the world include Cambodia, Malaysia and Myanmar. What Mangroves of the Future is doing in practical terms is giving out grants, both small and large, to different activities and initiatives. The small grants are anywhere between $10,000 and $25,000, and for larger projects, the grants are anywhere between $50,000 and $300,000. Around $1 million has been given for small grants so far, and about $3.5 million for the large grants. These grants are going to local organizations to do very local resource management. Another ongoing project is for assessing the effectiveness of marine protected area management. Thailand has 23 protected areas which cover both islands and coastal areas. What is trying to be done for the first time is to introduce a standardised approach to measure and monitor management effectiveness in an objective, standardised way using quite a detailed to tool which now runs to about 40 pages. This is being done for individual sites and for the whole system. The idea is then that we'll give a clear idea of what is being done well, what is not being done so well, what needs to be improved, where and how, and then there will be some clear priorities which will influence the government's allocation of budget to get some of these things done. The idea is that there will be a follow-up which includes both training and also showcase activities at a number of specific sites. The next project is about building coastal resilience to climate change. This project is all about increasing adaptive capacity of people and ecosystems on which they depend to cope with the anticipated impact of climate change and also to do better planning for disaster risk reduction through sound governance and planning. This is working in eight provinces along the Gulf of Thailand between Bangkok in Thailand and Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. So Chantaburi and Trap in Thailand, Koh Kong and Kampot in Cambodia, and Kien Gien, Sok Trang, Ben Tri and Kang Hyo in Vietnam. Something which a lot of people are talking about nowadays is vulnerability to climate change. Vulnerability has been defined as being dependent on three main factors. Exposure, sensitivity and adaptive capacity. So depending on how exposed you are to particular climate hazards, depending on how sensitive you are to that degree of exposure and depending on your ability to adapt and change will define your level of vulnerability. So if you want to increase resilience, which is the same as reducing vulnerability, it means we can try and reduce our exposure, try to reduce our sensitivity, or we can try to increase our adaptive capacity. When we talk about exposure, we are talking about the extent to which we experience climate. It doesn't matter if we are talking about a region, a country, a town, or a city, but the extent to which they experience the particular factors of climate that are of concern. Whether that is high temperatures or whether it is too much rainfall 
is characterized by magnitude, frequency, duration and or spatial extent of a weather pattern or event. Sensitivity is the degree to which a system is affected by or responsive to climate changes. So if we talk about the sensitivity of ecological systems to climate change, we are usually talking about tolerances to change and variability in physical and chemical conditions. An easy example of this is coral bleaching. If the temperature of the sea is too hot for too long, then you will get coral bleaching. In some places, you may have some corals that are more sensitive and some corals corals that are less sensitive, depending on the type of algae that they have. On the other hand, when we talk about social systems, we are talking about all the different factors in the economy, politics, culture and institutional factors that determine how vulnerable people are. Somehow, we need to put these two things together, see how each of them works and see they are both affected by climate change and see what we can do about it. One thing that we can do about it is the issue about our adaptive capacity, which is our ability to respond to those challenges through learning, managing risk and impacts, developing new knowledge and devising effective approaches. In ecosystems, adaptive capacity is related to genetic diversity, species diversity and heterogeneity within landscapes. Adaption requires, amongst other things, flexibility to experiment and adopt novel solutions. Here is an example of a study which was carried out in the Krabi province. The starting point is a scenario. Some of the main things that are going to happen with climate change are that you are going to see a shorter rainy season, but at the same time you are going to see a stronger monsoon season, with more severe storms and more rainfall in a shorter period and you're going to see a rise in sea levels. How that affects us to the extent of whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing really depends on your perspective and what you're doing, meaning if you're involved in tourism or agriculture, just happen to be living on the coast or you're in an urban community. So as an example, what does a shorter rainy season mean? Well, for tourism, it's not really a bad thing, as you will have more hot, sunny days, which is what the tourists want. On the other hand, it's not good for the farmers, as they will need to grow crops that need less water and grow in a shorter time. The stronger monsoon season will mean that there are more days with severe storms, more days with high winds, where fishermen in their small fishing boats won't be able to go out and fish, and it means that there will be a higher dependence on the inshore or nearshore resources because people won't be able to go out so much. At the same time, you have other things going on within the socio-economic picture of the world. You've certainly got tourism promotion and you've certainly got, over the last few years and probably more in the future, biofuel promotion. Again, if those things continue to happen, and you get more palm oil plantations and you get more tourists you will get a higher water demand so all of these things together will probably mean that there will be less fresh water for coastal communities and less fresh water to, to maintain coastal ecosystems one of the overall things that will happen will be that you will get more migration from the coastal areas to the urban centers which is something we are starting to see already Apart from all those other projects that have been mentioned before, the IUCN are also working with business groups and with the private sector. Here are a few examples which are happening in Thailand. The project that is running to achieve zero waste on Koh Tao is supported by Chevron Thailand. The Pram Brewery Six Senses Evason Resort and Spa is supporting mangrove conservation and the Mangrove Education Centre. And the third project is not actually relating to coastal issues. It's actually working in Chiang Rai, where PTT are supporting poverty alleviation projects. We're now going to talk a little about the Zero Waste Management Project on Koh Tao, 
as Phuket also has some issues with solid waste management such as issues with plastic bags and people are already doing some fantastic things to try to address this. Of course, Kotel is much smaller in terms of the size of the problem they have to deal with than it is here. However, we are looking at around 40 plus diving shops, up to 50 fruit and veg shops and small restaurants, about 300 resorts and around 40 convenience stores. And these are the starting points which are being looked at as to how the waste can be got rid of from these various sources with a green solution to the problem. So that brings us on to what people are already doing here in Phuket. Firstly, the Michael Marine Turtle Foundation, which was set up in 2002, which supports many local activities and projects, and this is such a simple idea and could be replicated at so many other places. If people are paying $100 or $200 a night to stay in the hotel rooms in Michael, nobody will complain if they are charged $1 a night extra to save Phuket's turtles and marine environment. Most people are actually quite happy that they are doing it. There is also now a campaign against plastic and plastic bags. There are also diving schools who are organising reef cleanups and hotels organising beach cleanups. People are also introducing artificial coral reefs by sinking boats to create new corals, which is really quite impressive. Now it's about what we can do together to improve it more.